What you are about to hear is an excerpt from last night's episode of Analytical Fanboys, where the Vacuuminator discusses his thoughts on the CW's take on Crisis on Infinite Earths, or at least the first three parts of it. This ran extremely long and added almost an hour to the podcast's runtime, so in order to save on rendering time and everybody's patience, I have kindly cut it out and am releasing it here as its own supplemental episode. Fair warning, this has no structure, no real point, and very little commentary from Boingo Writer. It is essentially a unedited Vacuuminator solo video, and as such, is not exactly recommended viewing. But because I am sure there are some people who will actually be interested in it, and because it will get clicks, here it is. Crisis Cast. Rant away. Okay, so um, for those of you who don't know, Crisis on Infinite Earths is kind of my favorite event. I love it just for the scope of it. Um, it, it is it is such a fantastically engrossing read to me. Um, so I had both high and extremely tempered expectations for this because I haven't kept up with the CW shows in quite a while. I've watched Supergirl through Season 2, I've watched Flash Season 1, Arrow up to Season 3, and that's it. After that, I just kind of I kind of gave up because they all seemed to degrade into horrible quality after the first season or two. Um, and uh, with some of those characters, I just, I just didn't want to go through that. Um, and, uh, um, I, I, and then I did kept... I did keep coming back in every year for the crossovers, however, um, because it's, it's fun to see all those heroes in live action doing things. However, I think I have a very different perspective on these crossovers than most people do, because a lot of people tend to take them very seriously and take a very big critical eye to them. And I'm over here going, nah, these are superhero wars movies with DC characters. <laughs> Okay, like, um, you got to go in going, this is a big, dumb cartoon for kids that's not going to make sense, but it's going to have a lot of fun moments. Otherwise, you're just going to get mad. Um, and, and I say that to people about the Superhero Wars movies. Like, I love Kamen Rider Tyson, Heisei vs. Showa. I know the main plot is stupid as fuck, but I don't care I like seeing that that diverse a crowd of writers interacting with each other, and uh, if you don't enjoy the Fies X subplot, you're an idiot. Just gonna put that out there. Um, and I have the same kind of thing with this, where a lot of people were looking at it, going like, "Oh my God, there's gonna be all these all these cameos. They're getting all these actors back. It's gonna be such a huge engrossing thing." And I kind of sat back there and went like. No, nope, most of these people are going to be on screen for 10 seconds to 5 minutes, and for the most part, it's going to focus on the casts of the CW shows, and uh, it's going to be just them doing a thing so they can get Supergirl in the same universe as all the other shows. Um, and it, and it, it basically is that, because it opens, and I did mark out quite hard, at this, it opens with them just straight up lifting the narration that opens the comic of, like, uh, the monitor talking about, in the beginning, there was one single black infinitude, and then the infinitude shuddered, and it created a multiverse. Um, and then after that narration is finished, we go into a montage of just, here's this Earth, here's this Earth, here's this Earth, cameo, 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 universe destroyed, universe destroyed, universe destroyed. We get, um... What's his face? The reporter that was investigating Batman in uh, Batman eighty nine. Um, so the um, eighty nine universe is canon with the CW shows now, but it gets destroyed. Um, then we Whoa, get eighty nine. So yeah. also the Schumacher ones. Oh, 
Here's the thing, because they also, you know how like Walking Dead had Talking Dead and then that spawned a trend of post new episode of show talk shows about the show? Yeah. They did one for this hosted by Kevin Smith, which normally I wouldn't watch because I'm in the camp that fucking hates hates Kevin Smith and thinks he's annoying. Fuck um, you, Kevin Smith is awesome. Okay, to each their own. Uh, but uh, they did one for this that was hosted by him, and they had the producer of all these shows on this, the executive producer, and he was dropping like little factoids here and there about how they look at certain things. And one of the things he said was, each Batman actor is in their own universe. So 89 and Returns happened in the same universe. Forever is in its own universe to them. And Batman and Robin is in its own universe. And the, and a fun thing with this is each, each Earth, the show that it's representing, that the number that Earth is, is the year that thing came out. So Batman 89 Earth is Earth 89. Um, which means Batman and Robin Earth is Earth 97. And going by the year I was born... I live in the same universe as George Clooney Batman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nipples. Oh, nipples. Um, but, they, but they show the reporter from 89. Then we get a brief flash of Jason Todd Robin and Hawk from um, Titans, which establishes that all the DC Universe shows are um, in this multiverse. However... It's literally just a brief flash, one close up of each of them, and then red light representing that the universe just got destroyed. Um, and from what I've heard, it's literally just stock footage. They just pulled two close ups from that show, which I think is hilarious. And it also kind of makes me mad and befuddles me because, A, if you were only going to have one character from that universe cameo in this, why would you not get Robot Man and have a scene of him looking up at the red skies saying, what the, and then his F-bomb getting cut off by the universe being destroyed? Um, and, and there's plenty of what the fucks you can use. Yeah. And then also, if this is going to end, which if it doesn't, I will cry extreme bullshit. Um, if... If this ends with all the Earths getting consolidated down into one universe, how's that going to work with the DC Universe shows? Are they going to start referencing CW? Is CW going to start referencing them? Because those two brands are really tonally at odds. Pull the Marvel and say we're condensing it into a smaller number of multiverse uh, universes so we don't have to deal with all of them. Yeah. Uh... The ones we want to keep, we'll keep. Marvel Zombies? Yeah, we're going to keep that shit. Yeah. Um, and then we get uh, Burt Ward um, on Earth-66. And uh, everybody marked out hard for um, Burt Ward, myself included, uh, because he shows up and we get a shot of him walking down the street as just old man Dick Grayson walking Ace the Bat Hound. Um, and then he looks up at the sky and says... Holy red skies of death. And he delivered it like he had not missed a single beat from that show, which was fantastic. And I also, I don't, I haven't seen anyone else say this, but if you look in the background of that shot, all the extras are dressed like it's still the 60s, which I thought was awesome. That's brilliant. Um, and uh, then we go into the main plot of it, which the first part is largely just uh, we're trying to make a stand on the Supergirl Earth, which is Earth 38, I believe. Um, and uh, it doesn't go well. Uh, like they, they show up, they realize that the antimatter wave is coming. Um, and then uh, Superman and Lois have just had a baby on Argo. They, they went to Ogre. I almost said Ogre. Argo, so Superman could retire and Supergirl could take over for him for a little bit, and uh, he could he could not have his powers and go have a baby with Lois. So uh, Jonathan Kent from Rebirth now exists in this universe, and that's exciting. I, I still wonder why we're advancing this Superman so much and not giving him a show. Um, and uh, 
Sorry, that's a notification. Um, then we, uh, as, as the wave is coming, they recreate or sort of homage the scene from Crisis where Earth, I think it's Earth 3, uh, Lex Luthor, who's a good guy, it's, it's the Justice Syndicate universe, he sends his, his only son to Earth 1 to be safe, and so Clark and Lois send off Jonathan Kent in a rocket because they think, oh, we, we don't have powers, we don't have a ship, we can't get away from the antimatter wave, so we're just, we're fucked. We got, we got to get the kid away from here, though. And they say the lines from Superman the movie that uh, Jor-El and Lara say to baby, uh, baby uh, Kal-El, which was cool, but also it just felt so weird and kind of overly fan servicey to do that when it when it's like okay how did you people not learn from the mistake of only having one baby size rocket uh but uh they get pulled away at the last second by the monitor and he also pulls in uh green arrow and all them and uh puts up a quantum tower on supergirl's earth which will dissipate the anti matter wave for long enough that they can make a stand and evacuate the earth as much as possible um which i really enjoyed because uh it literally looks exactly the same as it does in the comic they they didn't do the thing they usually do where it is the comic costume but we've kind of added some layers to it to make it look a little more grounded we've kind of made it look like a common rider suit of that costume um it's literally just a cgi model of one of those towers and uh, then they fight a bunch of shadow demons as people are trying to make their escape. And at the end of the episode, the monitor shows up and he's like, uh, hey, this isn't working. We can't beat them this way. So I'm going to pull all you back to Earth One. And Oliver goes, fuck that, shoots a bolo arrow at the monitor, which I don't know how that holds a cosmic being back and stops him from teleporting you, but okay. And he fights the shadow demons for another couple minutes until the monitor gets free and teleports them away. And then, and I know this isn't what they were trying to do, but they basically rip off Optimus Prime's death from Transformers the movie 1986. (laughs) The last scene of part one is Oliver bloody and battered on a table in the, the Green Arrow base. And everyone's standing around him like, Oliver, don't die! You can't die! And in the same way um, Optimus is like, Ultra Magnus, I'm going to pass the Matrix to you. He looks at Flash and is like, Barry, you're the best of us. You and Kara have to stop this. And he fucking bites it. And that was a great cliffhanger from the first part because a lot of us were going like, oh, if he's supposed to die in this, then he'll probably die in the Arrow episode, which is part four. He'll probably, like, do the same thing Supergirl did in the comic of having, like, a big knockdown drag-out fight with the Monitor, and he'll go out a big damn hero. And nope, he bites it right at the end of the first part, and uh, that leaves everybody kind of guessing, okay, what's going to happen next? All bets are kind of off, and even the Monitor says... Uh, this isn't how I thought it was supposed to go down, um, which does create a problem later in the in in the crossover because everybody still listens to him like he knows what he's talking about, even though he admitted, uh, "Yeah, this this wasn't supposed to happen like this." Um, uh, but then part two picks up with them getting the ship from Legends of Tomorrow, which I didn't know because I, I've never watched any Legends of Tomorrow. And also just recruiting a few more people. Um, and uh, then they... Um, Lex Lufor steals the Book of Destiny, which is basically like the Monitor's interdimensional remote control. Um, and he starts going across universes trying to kill various supermen. Um, basically saying, like, if the multiverse survives, I'm going to use this to take over all of reality and I'm going to make it so no Supermans can come and stop me, because apparently, and I've never seen him before, so I, I this was my first exposure to him, the, the Supergirl version of Lex Luthor is basically modern Lex Luthor, but he's acting, but he's played like Super Friends Lex Luthor. So he's a businessman, and he's supposed to be really cunning, 
but he acts like a maniacal cartoon character who just hates Superman's guts and wants to kill him. Yeah, that was a weird bit in the Smallville clip you sent me. Yeah. Um, uh, so he starts going around, and the monitor is like, okay, in order to defeat the anti-monitor, we're going to need to put together a team of paragons. We need paragons from across the multiverse. Um, we already, four of you are already four out of the seven paragons we need. So we're covered there, but the rest of you are going to have to go and look across the multiverse for, uh, these, these couple of paragons that we're missing. And, um, so, uh, the Supergirl version of Lois and Superman say, okay, we're going to go look for the paragon of resilience. I think it is. It's like, they say it's. It's a guy who they basically say it's in not so many words. It's a Superman who has been through a lot of shit and has still kept going. Um, so I'm figuring that's the kingdom come guy. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then he, he sends Batwoman and Supergirl uh, because the, the new TV Batwoman is in this. And again, my first exposure to her, I like her. Um, However, I was nothing in this made me go. I want to watch her show, um, and and they go off to look for the Bat of the Future, as uh, the monitor describes it, which annoyed me because um, even though I knew that the cameo that it is was coming, I went, "Oh my God, they're going to have Will Friedel show up as live action old man Terry McGinnis." That'd be interesting. Yeah. Uh, but no, they go to an Earth that is not a not Kingdom Come Earth, and I'm talking about this because there's a whole whole rant I want to go on with this. Um, they go to an Earth that is basically an original creation where Kevin Conroy Batman is living as a look uh, like a hermit in a rundown Wayne Manor with the endoskeleton suit, and then it's explained. That he's wearing that suit be, not because it lets him still be Batman, but because he needs it just to get around the house. Because at one point he just said "fuck it" and started killing everybody, and Superman stepped in and said, "Hey, you can't be killing everybody." And and Batman said, "Okay, I'm gonna try and kill you too." And the fight, and he did succeed in killing Superman, but the fight went so badly for him that now he needs the endoskeleton. And after the fight, he basically went like, oh, shit, what have I done? And became the and became a hermit. And then after that point in his timeline, Kate Kane became Batwoman because she was like, Bruce, you fucked up, but you still had some good ideas when you started out. I'm going to try and 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 do things right. I'm going to save Gotham. And she got killed like right away. And. Um, so this Bruce basically goes on a giant rant to our version of Batwoman about like, the world only makes sense if you force it to. Supergirl's gonna betray you eventually. Here's some kryptonite. Fucking kill her. Fuck the multiverse. Fuck my universe in particular. Fuck everything. And then he falls into an electrical thing and dies. You know what? It's fair enough that they give Kevin Conroy a different kind of Batman to play. Because he's been playing Batman forever. To go like, hey, this is a different version of Batman you get to play for this special thing. Yeah. Um, like, I like the performance. I just thought it was a weird concept. Um, and then they go back to the Wave Rider and the monitor is like, congratulations, you found your Paragon. And they're like, what the fuck? And he goes... Uh, yeah, you had to go. F- Batwoman had to go through that for her to discover that she is the paragon of courage. It's like, wh- how? Oh, how Are you this- the Wizard of Oz now? Yeah. Basically, that's what happens. And then for the next episode and a half, there's a subplot where Kara goes, Hey, what if I took the Book of Destiny and used it to bring my Earth back? Because my Earth got destroyed at the end of the first part. I'm sad that my Earth is gone, even though we saved most of the people. I want to bring my Earth back. Which, on the one hand, does make sense, because it's Supergirl going through, oh, I just lost my entire fucking planet again. Of course she'd kind of be upset. But on the other hand, the way they play it is basically just a bunch of scenes of Supergirl and Batwoman going, 
Kara, no. Kara, yes. Kara, no. Kara, maybe? Kara, no. Kara, no. Like, that's that's what the whole subplot basically amounts to. Kara, get a treat? Kara, no. You have a sock. No treat. Yeah. Um, and, uh, while that's happening, um, uh, the the Supergirl version of Superman and Lois and Iris West from the Flash go to uh, who is now Iris West Allen. They they got married in two crossovers ago, I think. Um, but they go looking for uh, the Superman they need. So first they go to a universe where Lex has already shown up and killed Superman. So we get a death of Superman homage that looks really bad and slapped together. Like, to the point where if, if you actually pay attention, because it's only on screen for a minute, um, they have the f- they do the famous panel where Lois is holding Superman and his cape is caught on a thing and fluttering in the wind. But it's so slapped together that the Superman she's holding is still wearing a cape. Mm. Mm. Then they go to the Smallville universe, which, I'll admit, I did enjoy that scene. However, after... A day or two later, after I thought about it, it's kind of hilarious and like a fittingly terrible end for Smallville because, okay, Chris loves Smallville. He's one of the people mm-hmm. who grew up with it. I saw. No, I didn't grow up with it. I watched it like after like a good couple of years after the whole thing was over. Okay, I saw it a good couple of years after the whole thing was over. However. I like Smallville up until about halfway through the third season, and then in my opinion, it, it becomes like just a farce. Um, and so I thought it was hilarious that the ending for this version of Superman is that he gave up his powers to have a family, and when he hears the multiverse's ending, he just kind of shrugs and goes back to work on his farm. I'm like, you know what? For that version of Clark Kent, that is a fittingly selfish and stupid outcome. Just letting that breathe for a second there. Um, uh, but but again, it, it was kind of nice for them to get a happy ending. And like, I'm sure a lot of people who grew up on Smallville were very happy with that, even though it's, even though they don't show it, but that, that universe probably got erased like 10 seconds ago. Well, it's 10 seconds later. Um, uh, but then the 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 team of Paragon Hunters go to the Christopher Reeve universe, and that, this is a big thing with this that I really enjoyed. They bring in Brandon Ralph Superman, and they basically go, "Yeah, Brandon Ralph Superman is Christopher Reeve Superman." Also, all the Christopher Reeve movies are canon with Superman Returns because he references an event from Superman Three. Um, like there, there's a moment where, um, after they've kind of established who the Superman is and what's been happening in his life lately, um, Lex shows up and he uses the book of destiny, destiny to make Brandon Ralph Superman evil and fight, uh, Supergirl Superman for him. I, I'm going to stop calling him Supergirl Superman. He's, uh, I believe the actor's name is Tyler Hitch. He's Tyler Hitch Superman. Um, they, they fight for a minute and then after he snaps out of it, he goes, Believe it or not, that's actually not the first time I've I've gone crazy and fought myself, which is a reference to Superman Free, and I enjoyed that. And also, at one point, he name drops his son Jason from Superman Returns. Um, however, it's not just been a happy family life for Christopher Reeve Superman. Um, since the events of Superman Returns, a nut job from Gotham didn't like the fact that the Daily Planet wasn't covering him enough. So he gassed the whole building, and Superman was the only person who survived. Damn. Yeah. Everyone from that universe, Perry, Lois, Jimmy, all of them, are dead as fuck, and Clark Kent is now the editor-in-chief of the Daily Planet. Which, on the one hand, congrats on the promotion! On the other hand, oh shit, that sucks. You're, you're a single dad with no friends. And the Joker killed them all. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, he part still- of me hope part of me hopes that that Joker is the is the Phoenix uh, Joker. Hmm. Um, and also they they use that as a way of saying 
Christopher Reeve slash Brandon Ralph Superman is so good and so pure of heart that he can lose everybody and still be hopeful and still want to be Superman and still want to help people. Um, like there's even a scene later in, in I think part three where um, he comes back from trying to evacuate a universe and he's really pissed off that he couldn't save everybody. And um, the Supergirl universe Lois uh, talks to him for a little bit and kind of tries to calm him down. And she asks him like, Hey, you're wearing the Kingdom Come suit. She doesn't say that, but you're wearing the Kingdom Come suit. Why is there black in your symbol now? And he goes, it's to represent darkness. But the S represents light because yin and yang. You can't have one without the other. But I am trying to represent light. Light is, hope is the light that lifts us out of the darkness. And that is what I am supposed to be. And it's like, mm, mm, I love this Superman. Um, uh, and, uh, what was I, where, where was I going next? Um, yeah, they, they get that Superman, they bring him back to the wave rider to be the, the Paragon. And then on earth one, uh, Brandon, Ralph, Adam, and, uh, I, and, uh, someone else go to recruit. And I forget his net. Uh, his first name, but it's Cho, the third person to be the Adam in the comics, um, who is not the Adam yet. I think they're setting him up to become the Adam in like the the rest of this season of Legends because supposedly Brandon Ralph is leaving the CW shows after Crisis. Um, so they come in and they recruit him to be a Paragon, and then it's like, okay. We've got the whole team together. We can we can do the thing. Um, and we're also only down to a couple more universes. Uh, so then part three opens with a cameo from Huntress from Birds of Prey, a.k.a. the episode of Analytical Fanboys that we lost the audio to and we'll never see the light of day. Um, and it was fun to see her again. She's aged. She's either aged incredibly well, or they caked her in makeup because, aside from a few wrinkles around her eyes, she looked basically the same. And uh, she's talking on the comms to Oracle, going, uh, "Hey, what the fuck's happening? Um, Oracle, are you there? Are you there?" And she disappears. Um, and. That was fun, but also it made me go, like, if you were only going to have her in that much, why did she came... Why didn't you lump her in with all the other quick cameos at the beginning of part one? And also, why are there a bunch of quick cameos at the beginning of part one? No cameos at the beginning of part two, and then this at the beginning of part three. It's it's very lopsided and kind of odd booking. Um, uh, But her universe gets disintegrated... Um, and meanwhile, while all of this has been happening, Oliver's daughter, Sarah Lance, who is the white canary from Legends of Tomorrow and is like an old ex-lover of Oliver's, um, who basically got, um, Captain Jack Hart (laughs) turned into the Captain Jack Hartness of this universe, where they had some cool concepts for the character and then they ditched them in favor of, hey, let's make them a time-traveling, extremely gay person. And give them their own show. Um, but uh, her, Oliver's daughter, and John Diggle um, get John Constantine, who um, the TV Constantine, which I love that show. I really wish they, it had gotten more seasons. Um, he shows up, and uh, he starts... Uh, they go on like a spirit vision quest thing to try and bring Oliver back from the dead. Uh, like they go to a universe that still has working Lazarus pits because apparently a few seasons ago in Arrow they destroyed all the Lazarus pits on Earth One, um, and uh, they bring Oliver's body back, and we get a cameo from Jonah Hex because it's in a mining cave in the Old West, um, and uh, Sarah gives him his scar, which I was kind of iffy on, but apparently that's also the same actor who played Jonah Hex when he showed up with his scar in an episode of Legends of Tomorrow, so okay, I guess it works. Um, 
But then they uh, have to go to Earth 666, and this is one of the few cameos that surprised me. One of the few cameos I did not go know about going in. But Lucifer from the, I believe it was NBC, now Netflix, Lucifer show, he, he appears for a second to have a little bit of a, uh, a um, quit fest with John Constantine and ultimately give them a uh, a basically a key card into purgatory so they can go get Oliver's soul and they they go and they do get Oliver and he is like oh, you guys came for me thank you um but then the fucking specter shows up and goes uh hey i know you guys want your friend back but uh he has another calling now and it's basically implied that Oliver Queen is going to become this universe's version of the Spectre now. Which I think is a pretty good way to end game Captain, of Amer- Captain America him out. Because he's not completely dead and gone, but he can't show up as that hero anymore. You could still bring him back one, one or two more times, but he's going to have a very different role. Um, and I'm into that. Uh, but they all show back up. They kind of reconvene back on the wave rider. And, uh, then the anti-monitor show. Oh, oh, no, before that, because there's a billion fucking subplots in this thing, just like the crisis comic. Um, we've, um, the cast of the flash show has found a doorway into the anti-monitors domain and um, they go into there and find out that the thing generating the antimatter anti wave in this is a machine that's basically shooting an antimatter ray into the multiverse because apparently the antimonitor just being able to do that because of magic cosmic powers is too silly for these shows. Um, but they, they notice the thing powering it is someone running really fast on a treadmill. Someone running so fast that they're basically a blur. And so they get that someone out, and it's John Wesley Shipflash, the Flash of Earth-90, in the full costume and everything. And uh, I'm not sure if they sh- they established that, because they, they've, they've had him show up like this before. They use John Wesley Ship as a lot of different versions of Flash in that show. Um, but doesn't he also play Barry Flash, uh, Barry Allen's dad in the show? Yeah, he plays his dad and he also plays Jay Garrick. And he also plays as he does in this, the flash of earth 90, which is just the flash. He was in the nineties TV show, but continuing on. Um, and they can, um, ugh, I lost my train of thought for a second there. Um, I don't know, remember if they actually established this in um, Elseworlds, because that's where he first showed up as the Flash of Earth-90. But on the Aftermath talk show, the executive producer confirmed that in the minds of the writers of the CW shows, the Flash of Earth-90 is on the same Earth as the unaired Justice League pilot. Oh my god. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, but he shows up and they're like, um, okay, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to make this machine stop? Oh crap. It's fucking up now. Cause we took you off of the, uh, the, the treadmill. There's a fail safe. Um, pariahs here. Now the, this, this, uh, this, uh, the TV adaptations version of pariah is one of the many permutations of Harrison. Well, for the multiverse, remolded into pariah which kind of works because that actor does actually kind of look like pariah but it's also just incredibly silly because flash will find any excuse to not lose that actor even though realistically they should not have used him anymore after season one um but uh he he shows up and he basically says there's a great tragedy that's going to happen here however i can help you uh, help it not be as bad. And Barry's going, oh shit, all season in my show, the monitor has been telling me 
um, because there's this newspaper article in the Future Vault that says in 2040 when crisis happens, or no, 2024 is, is the year they use. 2024, crisis is supposed to happen, and the Flash is supposed to vanish during that. Um, however, it's not 2024, and there's a fan theory that's been floating around that because they did Flashpoint in the Flash show, um, that fucked up the timeline and made crisis happen sooner and has allowed for events to be slightly different than the monitor thinks they're supposed to play out. But the monitor has basically been telling Barry all season that you are going to die in crisis. You have to make a massive sacrifice in order for things to play out the way they need to. And um, it's uh, from what I hear, it's basically been a long season of Barry raging against the dying of the light and slowly realizing that he basically has a terminal illness and he needs to he needs to say his goodbyes. Then, um, uh, so he's basically in that scene going, "Oh, this is where it happens. It's time for Flash to vanish in crisis. Where where let's do the panels where Flash is running and trying to save the universe, and he disintegrates. Um, and while that's happening, they also pull Black Lightning in to delay the machine exploding. Um." Because he has a show on the CW now, and apparently it takes place in a different Earth from Flash, Arrow, and Legends. Um, I know literally nothing about that show. However, I did watch the scene, the one, the one scene in the episode that came out this week that ties into Crisis, and it's um, it's basically from what I, I gathered from that scene. The plot of the episode is that there's a bunch of different versions of one of his daughters. And they can't all exist in the same universe. Kind of a Spider-Verse slash too much pink energy is dangerous thing. Um, and uh, at the end of that universe, at, at the end of that episode, when they're just finally being able to fix it, the anti-matter wave comes and wipes out his universe and he is saved at the last second. So he comes in going like, what the fuck is going on? Where's my family? What just happened? And they're like, uh, yeah, your family's dead can you help us with this thing? And he's like, what the fuck? Um, so that was an interesting introduction to that character. Uh, but then John Wesley shit flash basically goes like, uh, no, my Earth's, you're not going to kill yourself, Barry. My earth is gone. It was destroyed back in else worlds. There's pretty much no getting it back because what the fuck are they going to do with those characters? So I'm going to get on the treadmill and I'm going to die. And also I'm going to act the crap out of this scene. John Wesley Ship kind of gives one of his best performances ever in that scene. And it's also really sweet and touching because as he's disintegrating, we get a, we get some footage from the, the flash show um, put in as kind of like a representation of in his final moments, he's thinking of, um, his love interest from that show. And it's, it's like a tender moment from that show. I, I don't know what moment it is exactly. Cause I haven't seen the nineties flash show, but he disintegrates and uh, they go, okay, we dissipated the antimatter wave. Now it's time to find the anti-monitor and fight him. So they go back to the wave rider and they're like, okay, monitor, what do we do? And then Ravager shows up because she's been off doing reconnaissance for a little bit. And we find out, oh, she got possessed by the monitor. And now the monitor's here, and he somehow reconstituted the antimatter wave, and it's wiping out Earth 1, and, uh, oh shit, we're fucked. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Pry goes, oh wait, that's right, I have powers too! And he teleports all the paragons away to a location that is kind of outside of space and time. I'm not sure they talk about it like they've been there before. Um, uh, but they all get away just as the anti-matter anti wave... I don't know why I'm having so much trouble saying that tonight. But it comes and wipes out Earth-1 and the Wave Rider. So all the Earths are gone now. And our cliffhanger is that the Paragons are all standing trying to get their bearings in this, this place outside of space and time, which uh, is called the Vanishing Point. I had mm -hmm. to think for a second, but I remembered it. It's called the Vanishing Point. Um, and just as we're about to go to the to be continued, Brandon Ralph Superman starts disintegrating 
He disappears. He dies in Kara's arms because Kara is also one of the Paragons, homaging in reverse homaging the, the Supergirl dying in Superman's arm panel. Um, and also kind of ripping off I Don't Want to Go from Infinity War. Like, it's it's a very similar feel to that scene because he's disintegrating and he's going like, I don't know what's happening. Um, and then in his place comes this show's version of Lex Luthor and he's like, uh, yeah, everything was disappearing around me and I was able to get out of the cage you guys put me in, in the Wave Rider. Uh, so I grabbed the Book of Destiny and I went, hey, Destiny could use a rewrite. So he wrote his name over Brandon Roth Superman in the page where it says they're all the Paragons. And it's like, okay, what are we going to do now with Lex instead of Superman? Which on the one hand, brilliant cliffhanger. Really lives, really leaves people guessing where things go from here. On the other hand, it's kind of frustrating because a lot of us, myself were included, were hoping all our, our, our team of people that would fight the anti monitor in the final part would be made up of like a few people from the CW shows and then people from various universes. And we almost had it one person from a different universe in these shows. And then he gets replaced by another person from the CW shows. And it's and the team of Paragons is just a bunch of random fuckos from the CW shows. Which is like, okay, I understand you did that because those are the actors you have under contract and they're the actors who are going to keep being in on your on your channel after this is over so you want to feature them and put them over as much as possible but why are you doing crisis if you're not featuring characters from other universes very heavily um and also like why did you bring in all these different versions of superman um if you weren't gonna put over tyler hitch superman because that's another thing that's going throughout all of this he he gets compared to the other supermen constantly and they basically bury him on the level of triple h burying people during the reign of terror like it's embarrassing how bad he looks during this because he basically does nothing he has none of the gravitas that he's had in his other appearances because up until now every time he's been in a thing everyone has always acted like oh shit superman's here this is amazing this is awesome look it's fucking superman oh my god and now it's just like yeah, Superman's here. His wife's here. He got a kid. He's trying to find his kid. He found his kid. Now he's going to go find another Superman. Okay. It, it, it's, it's really weird how, how little they, they give him to do. Um, uh, but, uh, again, that's where we're left off is everybody's kind of going, oh, shit, what are we going to do? There's no universes left. We got to go find the monitor and fight him. And uh, basically, my prediction, because we're not getting parts four and five until January 14th, they'll be airing back to back as like a two part movie finale kind of thing. My prediction is that at part four will be like 10, 15 minutes of setup, and then the rest of it's just going to be a giant fight scene of them fighting the monitor in a quarry because we've in the trailer for parts four and five, it's just a lot of footage of those people standing at the Paragon standing in kind of an Epic Manator in a quarry. It looks like a goddamn power Rangers episode. Brilliant. Um, and, uh, then part five is going to be everything's in one universe. Now here's us visiting a bunch of characters and showing what the new status quo for everybody is. I'm, that is like what I think they're going to do and what I hope they're going to do. I would not put it past these producers to just um, pull something out of their ass and be like, now the entire multiverse is back because we love playing with multiverse. Um, or going like, uh, we have a few herbs back. I really hope they will actually do the crisis thing, though, and put everything in one universe. Um, however... Again, just to reiterate a few points, that will put some stuff very tonally at odds with each other. And um, I, I just, I don't know. Um, like, I, I want it to go one that way. Logically, it should go that way. But also, it doesn't make sense with a few things. And um, 
I read somewhere one of the producers said, we don't think our universe is all that convoluted and muddy, so we're not doing Crisis for the reason they did Crisis in the original for in the original version, which is like, okay, why are you doing Crisis besides name value then? And that's pretty much everything I have to say on that. So uh, let's see. What's, what's the time stamp now? We went from 56 minutes to an hour and 42 minutes. So that's definitely going to be a 0.5. Um, hope everyone enjoyed <laughs> listening to it. Oh, God. This, uh, oh, boy. Oh, boy. I'll put it out the next day from this podcast. People aren't going to have to wait that long. And if I remember how I've scheduled things correctly, this will probably actually come out a few days before parts four and five air. So, hey, timing, getting them clicks. The, the hashtag clicks. <laughs> <laughs>